Hello, I'm Harinda Baveja. Joining me today, Masuma Ranalvi, one of the pioneers who's waging a very brave battle against female genital mutilation. None of us knew that this practice existed in India or that it was so prevalent in the heart of the financial capital in Mumbai, where young children aged six and seven, young girls in fact, aged six and seven, are taken to dark, decrepit buildings uh, on the pretext of being given chocolates and ice creams by their aunts or mothers or even grandmothers. They're taken to these dark, dingy rooms where their clitoris is cut. Now remember, there is no scientific laid down procedure to how much can be cut. So young girls are just being subjected to cuts, nicks, sometimes mutilation. Masuma, uh, you've started an online petition. You're fighting against this practice of female genital cutting or female genital mutilation. Both phrases are used. In the Bora community where it's practiced, it's called Khatna as well. Uh, what are the health consequences? You know, I know there, are, there is psychological trauma. You know, there's a physical price to be paid. You're fighting this battle because you still remember your experience from that time. You yourself were cut. Can you today please share with people who are wanting to listen to you about this practice? Um, the physical and emotional and psychological effects of uh, FGM or female genital mutilation uh, as it's known uh, is actually tremendous. It's actually been documented by the World Health Organization and uh, ranging from uh, excessive bleeding to infections to issues with urinary tract uh, infections uh, at the physical level. At the psychological level, there is the whole trauma of deceit, the whole trauma of being taken and someone cutting you, someone near and dear to you taking you and, uh, you know, uh, cutting you in a manner without information is a scar which remains. Uh, but more importantly, the whole purpose or the whole reason behind this uh, practice of uh, genital mutilation is to curb the sexual desire of a girl child and the thinking behind it is the girl as child as she is a god given nature's made product you have to tamper with it you have to control it because you feel that in your society a girl has no right to sexual pleasures and that she will become promiscuous if she is not let uh, controlled and to preserve the sanctity of your marriage it is a girl child which is subject to it so the i think the insidiousness of the whole reasoning behind female genital mutilation is what is appalling and totally unacceptable at what stage did you decide that you want to reveal your identity you want to come out in the open and you want to start saying stop female genital mutilation. It's a very brave call. For a long time, you know, the voices remained anonymous. But today I'm glad you're here. People can see you. You're willing to show your face. At what stage did you decide that this battle now is so important that I cannot hide behind the veil anymore? Um, <clears throat> so let's go a little into the history of my case. This happened to me about 42 years ago. And uh, at the time when it happened to me, of course, I was traumatized, I was in pain, and it has affected me emotionally, psychologically, in a very deep manner. But 42 years is a long time, I healed and I moved on in my life. I never really knew what happened to me because the whole practice is shrouded in secrecy. Even today, there are young girls who are being cut, they're taken by the mothers and they're being cut. The mother doesn't know why she is doing it, neither does the child have any information about it. So the secrecy and the clandestine nature of this practice continues till today. So when I was around 30, I realized that what happened to me was genital mutilation and the reason why it happened to me and it really angered me a lot. Uh, reason why I have spoken out today in 2015 and 2016 
is the practice continues even now we are talking about equality of women today we are talking of making laws where women and men are at par you have women who are fighting on on fronts they are fi flying jet planes and you know there is a whole discourse on how do we bring women and men at par and there is an equal space for them yet in my society in my community you have a practice where young girl children are being cut needlessly for a medieval cultural practice to curb their sexual desire and this is what angered me and this is what i felt that if we do not speak today because i am not alone in this fight there are a lot of women from the community who have joined hands with me we have a platform which is known as speak out on fgm and the whole idea behind speak out on fgm as the name says is we want to speak out we want to talk about what happened to me to us so that we prevent the future generation from being subject to this horrific practice so we have a question now coming in from devanshi khetapal uh, she's a young teenager and a journalist for a social media organization she's asking masuma how can we as young teenage girls extend a helping hand um, thank you for your support devanshi uh, there are many ways in which uh, you can extend a support to us Uh, the very first thing which we are trying to do by communicating with you and by communicating to the world at large is we want this practice to come out in the open it has been secret and that is why it is continuing that is why none of us ever had the courage to oppose it by bringing it out in the open we want more and more people to acknowledge that something like this is happening we of course have a signature petition which is addressed to the government of india and we are asking the government that we have to have a strong law which will ban fgm in india let me tell you that the united nations has declared fgm to be a gross human rights violation and a child rights violation india is a part of united nations india is also a signatory to cedo so india should pass a strong anti fgm law so one way you can extend support to us is by of course signing on this petition which is available on change.org it is end fgm in india the second way in which you could probably help us is to spread awareness what we are doing is trying to spread awareness let this conversation be public let others know since you are a journalist in the social media you could probably write about it share this information with others so many more will know about it and you are a young person so you would be having young friends and i'm sure you have young bora friends so whether it's a bora girl or a bora boy who's tomorrow going to be a mother or a father should know about what this practice is shouldn't blindly be doing something because you're being told to should question the efficacy and the need for such a practice in our community and of course take stand against it so we did write about it in hindustan times masuma and of course you helped us with that process and there's been tremendous feedback a lot of shock because a lot of people are writing in saying they didn't know it was happening right here in india now uh, there are various ways of addressing the issue your petition i know is addressed to three ministries women and child development law and health, health. because all three you know there are repercussions for women uh, in all three uh, spheres so uh, are you basically looking at a ban on this practice in india because there is currently no uh, law against female genital cutting in india or do you think it's more important to have conversations within your community which is the bora community and what about the role of the clergy i can see a, que a question here how are you convincing religious scholars to you know end this practice because if the saidna who is your religious head today decides to say it's wrong don't do it it will probably end overnight absolutely absolutely yeah absolutely so <clears throat> actually we have a three pronged uh, strategy as far as uh, our work is concerned on the fighting fgm uh, one is of course we want the support of a larger community outside of the bora community the petition of course is that platform 
we need a law in place there is an importance of a law i understand that a law will not probably end the practice but you need the backing of a statutory provision saying that something like this is unacceptable for our girls and for our women and as i said it's a gross violation of human rights we are supposed to be equal by the constitution of india so this is a violation of that basic fundamental constitutional principle so we should have a law in place having said that the second part of our strategy which is a very important part of our strategy is to talk and have conversations within the community with women with men with elders with youngsters and a process of sharing information talking about our experiences like my generation for instance each and every woman of my generation has been cut and i can tell you that very few women of my generation actually know what happened to them or have ever discussed it with anybody so conversation is important having a space and a person to share that with that experience with coming out and you know narrating the trauma which you went through i think that is a very cathartic process so that is what we need creating awareness amongst youngsters young girls young women young mothers who have children who are 4 and 5 years and who will in the next one or two years be called upon that okay your child is 7 now please take her for this process so these conversations is what is the second part of our campaign and the third part of our campaign of course is to have a conversation with the clergy you know we need to have a dialogue because after all we are members of a community and the interests of the women of the community should be at the heart of the religious leadership so as a part of that process we have even given a letter to the clergy asking them that this is what we as women of the community have suffered please listen to our pleas we want this to be banned in our community so that is the third process so we are it is a all invasive and all inclusive fight on all fronts so there was a petition in 2011 by a anonymous bora woman which was addressed to the clergy but i believe there was absolutely no response in fact there was silence now you tell me that you have written a letter to the saidna so uh, share with us and people who are listening to this chat Uh, what is it that you want from the side now what are the thoughts you have conveyed in your letter and how recently have you sent this letter uh so basically we are addressing the sayatna as daudi bohra women who belong to the community who accept his leadership as our religious head and as women we have kept silent for all these years but there are some things which we have suffered so we want to share that experience with him and we have narrated our experiences in the letter and we are telling him that it has affected us physically it has affected us emotionally it has affected us psychologically it is a practice which is a medieval practice which doesn't have a religious basis so at least let us have a conversation about it let us understand from your perspective if there is a validity to the practice why is it nobody sharing information with us you know and of course we as modern 21st century women cannot find this practice acceptable so we are completely against it and since he is our religious head no better place to go than to him and as you rightly said one decree or dictate from him and the practice is over it's end of it so but why is the clergy interested in keeping the practice going why do they think it is necessary for bora women to be cut to be mutilated this question has to be handled by them because we have really tried to understand the why of it and we really have not got answers so we need to understand the why of it and we need to know why is it that this has to continue you know i mean at a particular date and time maybe it was a prevalent practice maybe centuries ago hundreds of years ago maybe in in certain communities this practice there were many practices which are totally unacceptable now i mean in india if you see we've had social reform movements we had a practice like sati which was acceptable in a particular day and time but it was done away with you know so this is a practice where we need to question the efficacy of it tomorrow we are evolving we are changing everything about us is changing so why not we look at this practice Another question from Pavo Bhomik who wants to know where all in India 
is this happening where are women taken which parts of india so uh, okay so boras typically are settled in the western part of india uh, largely in four states uh, maharashtra gujarat uh, madhya pradesh and rajasthan so you will predominantly find boras in these four states and in these four states it is across the board it is in uh, cities as well as in rural areas so it will be in bombay and it will be in villages of maharashtra uh, like i come from a village in maharashtra where it is practiced it is in villages of gujarat it will be in cities of gujarat like uh, ahmedabad surat baroda in madhya pradesh in rajasthan same so by and large it is here i'd i'd like to add that there are bohras who are settled in pakistan there are bohras who are settled in the us in the uk in australia in sri lanka and bohras in all these parts of the country also practice fgm so yeah so masuma you are one of three sisters and all three have been cut right i have to ask you do you hold it against your mother not at all not at all and i never held it against my mother because um i i felt my mother is part of the same system which has uh, oppressed women and uh, which has reinforced ideas of patriarchy and which has made women the forebearers and the carriers of patriarchal practice so my mother is also a victim of the system so is my grandmother and uh, so are the women of my generation and so are the younger women who are today doing it to their daughters so i personally will did not have a any grudge against my mother i had anger when i realized what happened to me i had a lot of anger and i had a lot of frustration that this how could this happen to me why did this happen to me you know i had this rage within me uh but uh, by then uh, i it was at a very late age at around 30 when i was 30 i realized that this this is what had happened to me by then i think the anger to my mother towards my mother was not there but there are a lot of young girls today who are very angry with their mothers i know of a lot of young girls 15 year olds 18 year olds because they are exposed they have information they have read about this and they realize that this is what has happened to them and they are fighting with their mothers yes there is a lot of rage which these young girls have against their mothers and there are mothers who are not letting it happen to their daughters as well i did meet a few who said no way we know no let this happen to our daughters so there is slow change but some change yes definitely there is change and and it's very heartening it's it's extremely heartening <clears throat> to know that there are women who are taking a stand today there are men and women who are taking a stand today you know there are husbands and wives who are collectively deciding we do not want to harm our child we do not want to let our child go through this pain and this trauma and we will not do it there and the this tribe is increasing and i hope and pray that there'll be more many more such young mothers and young fathers and young grandmothers who take a stand against you know doing this but the practice still continues it is still very prevalent uh, young girls are still being taken maybe not to midwives but i believe to doctors in hospitals that are run by boras so the practice continues uh, to me uh, what is also upsetting is that women are doing it to women you know it's a practice that is being perpetuated by women themselves so somewhere you need to reach out to the women as well and make them understand that they need to stop this absolutely absolutely it's a practice which is wholly perpetuated by women you know it's 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 entirely a women phenomena and it is women who are doing it it is the women who are the cutters it is the women who take the girl child to do it so the entire uh, process is through women and uh, yes that is what is happening and i'd like to add uh, something to what you earlier said that you said that today the practice is happening in do- in hospitals and doctors are doing it but not entirely in rural parts of india it continues to be the midwife it continues to be the unhygienic conditions it continues to be implements like a razor or a blade to do it so it is only in the cities where there is a bit of sophistication and there is a bit of uh, you know uh, realization okay let's do it in a better way 
where there is a doctor and where there is a hospital and where there is a clinic to do it but in most of the other parts in rural areas and even other smaller cities it is continues to be the midwife who continues the practice so um why does a mother decide one day that I have to take my daughter, she is age 7, she needs to be cut? Uh, is there some pressure that is brought about uh, on her? How does it work? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fantastic network. It's an amazing network actually, you know, this whole community is organized through a fine network of Jamaats and wherever there is a cluster of Vora families living together, there is a Jamaat created with a hierarchy uh, system of Jamaat leaders who ensure that the practices are, uh, you know, met with. And uh, so the minute the child is seven, the mother will get a call from either the mother-in-law or her own mother saying your daughter has reached seven and now is the time for you to take her and get it done. And so it's, it's actually marvelous that in this day and age, in far off and far flung places also it is managed and it is done and you know and it's ensured that this happens I see a question from Sheikh Riaz what measures are you taking to solve the problem from the roots itself I mean we have covered ground on this question but the whole issue of covering the, I mean, handling the problem from the roots itself, as, as I've earlier said, the first step is for us to understand why this practice is there, to understand the need for a practice in this day and age. And in whatever conversations we have had, and in whatever information we can get, because people are very reluctant to give us information on this subject. We've asked for religious literature, we've asked for scriptures, we've asked for if there is a justification, if there is a, a some kind of a religious sanction for it, please share it with us, please tell us. Nobody has really done that with us. So that is really missing and we are struggling to find that. But whatever conversations, whoever has been willing to share with us, it is the idea which comes to back to us is that it is a practice perpetuated to control your sexual desire and there is nothing else to it but that and that is a practice and that is an understanding which we have to fight so it's at the level of an idea it's at the level of an ideology see we are battling are battling patriarchy and patriarchy is a centuries old phenomena which is really not going to go off in a day or two so our whole work, in a sense, is a process, is a process about talking about it, is a process about understanding it, and more importantly, about questioning it, you know, uh, in our lives. You use the word patriarchy. So, uh, you know, the question in my head right now is, are the fathers involved in this decision? Do the brothers know? Is it a discussion amongst the parents before the girl is taken? Uh, to what extent are the men in the family involved in this? Um, or are women helping propagate patriarchy? Women definitely are helping propagate patriarchy. There is no doubt about that. And they are the, I said they are the flag bearers of patriarchy in uh, this particular case. And in many cases, it's the women who themselves internalize patriarchy and then take it forward but uh, the question about fathers and uh, husbands um, you know I really don't know much about this because we have tried to talk to a lot of men we've tried to talk to a lot of fathers and we've got different responses so in some cases there are fathers and husbands who are totally ignorant who have no clue that this has happened to their wives, their daughters, their sisters. My God, yes. Oh. Yes, so there is one section which is ignorant and you know, who are shocked that, oh, this happens to our women folk. And there is one section which is aware that this is happening and uh, which, uh, you know, is uh, uh, in a way abets it, in a way promotes it, in a way, you know, says, yes, it should be done. So there are these two segments which are there and our, of course, effort is to address the people who are ignorant, the men who are ignorant, to tell them that, listen, this is what is happening. This is what is happening to your wives, to your daughters, to your sisters. Please understand. Please understand the implications of it and please support the wife in taking a progressive decision on the subject. 
So tell me, uh, you've been having conversations uh, with members of your community, uh, both men and women. Does cutting and mutilating the clitoris, I'm sure it's affecting marriages. But are they acknowledging the fact that yes, it is affecting our marriage? Uh, I don't know how far men and women are willing to accept that. But yes, there have been some cases of uh, women uh, and men having problems in sexual relationships in marriage. Yes, I'm sure there is a problem. Because also the unscientific way in which it is done. So you really don't know if you have a midwife who is going to do it with an implement which is like a blade or a razor. And uh, you know, a child is a child. A child must, might, might just move while the process is happening and something else might get cut. So you may want to cut a small bit and a large bit can cut. You see the whole, the nature of the practice itself and the manner in which it is done. So there is no control over that. And there is no uniformity in the practice as such across the board. So there may be some children who've hardly felt it and you've hardly had a bad experience. And there may be another child who's had excessive bleeding and who's had, you know, repercussions on, you know, maybe a clitoris has been cut and, you know, it's, it's, it's a nerve endings of extremely sensitive tissue there, you know. So it, it, it will have implications on, on that as well. Uh, a question from Yashweer Dabas. Isn't there any law against FGM in, in India? We know there isn't. You've already answered that. Is the government now doing anything to stop this practice, Masuma? I know that's where your fight is headed. You know, you're, uh, you've approached the ministries of women and child development. You've spoken, I mean, you will be talking to the ministries of law and health as well. Uh, what are the chances of getting a ban on FGM in India. And why, uh, may I ask one question of my own, uh, have you not approached the National Human Rights Commission? Because as you said, and put very well, this is a human rights violation. It's also child sexual abuse, which again is a human rights violation. No, we will do it. We will do it. It's not that, uh, you know, we don't want to do it. We want to approach everybody and anybody who will make a difference in this battle. So uh, we will do this. We will approach the National Human Rights Commission. Uh, we will approach the National Women's Commission. Uh, we want to approach the government. As to their responses, really, it will be speculation at this point of time as to how they are going to respond. But we are going to go with a very earnest plea that this is what has happened. This is how we are affected. And this is what we expect from you. So Veena Pradesh has written to say great initiative Hindustan Times. Thank you so much for writing that. Uh, Masuma, yeah, I would uh, also like to thank uh, Hindustan Times to you know uh, write about it and you know give it so much of space and coverage because you know ultimately um, we are a very small minority within a minority and us, our issue is really not center stage. It's not an issue which, which affects many people. So we are just a small community of 2 million people and uh, of which half of us are women who are being subject to it. So in that sense, it's not mainstream, but HT has, uh, you know, put it on mainstream and helped us reach our voices across the country and probably across the globe as well. And uh, thank you very much for that, you know, because I think Speak Out on FGM, our endeavor is to reach to wherever we can. In fact, uh, I have to admit that I did not even know that the practice existed till I got uh, a copy of the uh, petition. online petition to sign. And it came to me from Arifa Jodi, who's one of the 18 women. That's uh, right. You know, who've penned, signed, put their names on the on, petition. On the petition, yeah. So, and I just got pulled into the story because one, it's a gross violation of human rights. Uh, unimaginable trauma all of you have lived through it you're 49 you know uh, you're talking about it now uh, for years I've spoken to other women who just blocked the memory didn't remember because it was so painful that they'd also been cut and uh, the good news of course not in India but there has been a conviction in Australia uh, where a mother got a Bora nurse to cut her daughter. It led to a case in court 
and there has been a conviction. We don't know what the sentencing is yet, but it will lead to a seven year sentence. Now, interestingly, the Jamaats in Sydney, which runs the affairs of, on behalf of the Bora community in Australia, has actually put out an advisory on their website saying that we ought to respect the laws of the country in which we live and kindly do not get your children cut. Now, for me, it's the message there is, we are not saying don't do it because, you know, it's harming the girl child, but don't do it because it's against the Australian law. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, yeah, interestingly, this letter, uh, one is it did not does not even speak about how it harms the girl child. Uh, two, it does not even speak about how uh, the practice is legitimate as per the religious sanction. So it's just a uniform statement saying that the law of the land is prohibiting it, so you just stop the practice. And uh, it's been issued uh, to Sydney, Melbourne and now even UK. So I think there is a certain, um, uh, it seems like they're trying to escape the law and since there is a conviction in there happening and no, conviction has already happened, sentencing is yet to happen. And in the sentencing hearing, the, gov the, the judge has asked them that uh, there is no repentance. There is no repentance on your part as to you want to change. In lieu to that, in response to that, this uh, letter has come. Nevertheless, we welcome the letter because it's a good letter. And it says that, you know, as Boras, we believe in the law of the land. So it should be banned in these countries. And which is why I think we should have a law in India as well. And... Uh, that uh, it should be banned here as per the law of the land. There's a question from Suvina Singh who wants to know why it is done that you answered. Uh, there's a process associated with, you know, curbing the sexual energy of, uh, of young girls in the hope that they will stay loyal in their marriages, in the hope that they will not stray or become promiscuous. Now, all these arguments actually make me angry. Okay, I'm not a Bora woman, but they make me really angry. The second part of the question, which is interesting, what are the benefits, what are the benefits associated with cutting? Now, from the perspective of those who think this custom should survive, according to them, what are the benefits of this? I think this is a question which they can feel. Really, because uh, they have not told us what are they. I was not told. I was cut, but I was not told that A, B, C are the benefits you have got. None of us have been told about the benefits. As far as I am concerned, as a victim of FGM, I don't know of any benefit. I spoke to some women uh, when I was reporting this story out of Mumbai, because it's very prevalent in Mumbai. Uh, I was quite shocked with the responses I got um, from the voices who still support female genital mutilation and the arguments they made were the following one that the clitoral head is unwanted skin number two it is a source of sin now all very shocking arguments but you have to obviously one day sit down with women who think this and try and change their way of thinking. Now what would you like to tell these women who think that it is unwanted skin and that it is a source of sin? I know the question is annoying but if you have to change mindset Masuma then you have to take the bull by its horns. So uh, I'd like to answer it in this way. Uh, first and foremost, let us understand that this practice is only happening amongst one community, amongst a large Muslim community in India. Okay, so Boras are part of the Muslim community in India. We have a large, very significant community. And within this community, 17% are Muslims. Within them, Boras are fraction of a, of a percent of this community. 
So the entire Muslim community in India does not practice FGM. It is only the Bauras who practice FGM. So there is no religious sanction for this practice as such. Because if there would have been a religious sanction of the practice, the other Muslims in this country would have also practiced FGM, which they are not. Okay. Secondly, look at the community around you, look at women around you who are not cut. Do you find them promiscuous? Do you find them going astray? Do you find their marriages falling apart within Muslims or within any other community? I mean, what sort of an argument is this? This is the body which is given to you by God. This is a nature given body and this is all a part of your body. How can you say that you want to cut a part of your body because you feel it is haram nibhuti as, as what the whole perspective is? It does not make any sense. The reason they are saying is that they want to curb you and they want to control you. They want to tell you that you are not allowed any sexual pressure. And if your marriage has to work, it takes two for a marriage to work. It is not just the woman who will make the marriage work. It is the man also who makes a marriage work. So there has to be an upbringing. You bring up your child in a way that your child understands what a fidelity in a marriage is and what is the way a marriage works not by cutting a part of the body of that child explain to one explain one thing to me masuma i, I find it very hard uh, to understand um, you know bora women such as yourself are doing so well you're a publisher i've interviewed other women across the world in fact they've traveled across the world they're doing good jobs they're scientists psychologists, journalists, I mean, think of the job and you have a Bora woman doing it. Yet, you have this very regressive practice. I don't understand the dichotomy between the regressive practice and the very liberal Bora woman. Uh, it is a contradiction. It's a, it's a very, very strange dichotomy. And perhaps that is why people cannot understand why this is happening. It's, it's always one huge question mark on people's faces when you tell them that this is happening amongst the Bora community. Because two things about the Bora community. One, it's, it's a wealthy community. Two, it's an educated community. In fact, the women in this community would be far much more educated than the men in the community because the men by profession are traders. It is the women who've gone out and sought education. Women are doing this. I think the reason for this lies in two things. One is ignorance. There is no information which women have about this practice. It is being fed to them or it's being given to them as it's a cultural tradition. It's a religious tradition and you have to do it. There are many traditions which you follow. Everybody follows in their life. So when your child is two, you do this. When your child is four, you do this. When the child is just born on the fifth day, you do this. Everybody has their own sets of religious traditions. So similarly, this is one religious tradition which is kind of given across. Okay, okay when your child turns seven, you do this. Beyond that, there is no questioning of why this is happening. What is it that you're cutting? How will it harm my child? How will it benefit my child? If at all, it is a beneficial thing. This ignorance is the biggest evil which is there in this community. Unfortunately, even the educated women are not questioning this practice. That is one part of the answer. The second part of the answer is where women have understood what it is also, which I think is a very, very small minority. They are not willing, they, they are not willing to uh, go over and above that and say, no, we won't do it because of fear. This is an entrenched community, a community which is controlled. As I told you, there is this whole network of Jamaats which exists all over the world. And every uh, move and every part of your secular life and religious life is in a sense controlled by the religious clergy. And women or men who oppose any practice fear persecution. There is this hidden fear of a social boycott or an excommunication. What form does the persecution take? I mean, I'm sure there can be a backlash, but how does it make itself evident? Uh, how does social boycott as a practice work? Is no, that what? if the religious clergy decides to punish you or excommunicate you, as you say, that amounts to a backlash. So what can they do to 
you know make you feel persecuted or make you feel that you know stepping out of line so yes. i'll tell you in many ways it can happen so you're living in a community you're living in an area where there are boras no bora will talk to you your relatives will not your extended families will not meet you you will not be allowed or you will not be invited for marriages and birthday parties and social functions you will not be allowed to go into a mosque oh. more importantly when your family any member in your family dies they will not allow you to bury it as per the religious rites Really? So these are very strong. Economically, you get in, impinged by if you have your business in that area. No bora is going to do trade with you, so your business is over. So it's it's got implications, and there are serious implications, you know. So um, uh, people are not willing to take the risk. Naturally, so you know, people do not want to antagonize this, and there is this whole fear. So what has happened is because of this persecution complex. people mm. believe, obey anything that is told to them so things which may not be good for them which may be harmful also have a tendency to be accepted and obeyed so there's a fear of being ostracized there's a fear of being ostracized i see an interesting question from mubarak zauria who is clearly still supporting female genital mutilation he's saying when respected masuma ranarvi madam says there is no religious dictum on female genital mutilation she is plainly plainly speaking lies daimul islam is authority book for boras not only this book but several prominent sunni books including bukhari and muslim speaks in favor of female genital mutilation i'm sure you have a lot to say to mubarak sir okay so i i would love to have a look at these books and i'd like to uh, read this uh, daimul islam and uh, the books which he's talking about but uh, the the primary uh, book for muslims and for uh, believing muslims is the book of the prophet the quran and as far as the quran is concerned there is no mention of fgm in it and uh, there can be a practice which has been adapted or adopted later on and probably respond to uh, this mr mubarak and uh, do that but as far as i am concerned and as far as i know and nobody has yet said this to us is that the quran does not speak about or mention fgm in any way so it does not draw and in any case you explain the paradox to me if it is if it were part of the religious text the quran why is it that the muslims in india do not practice fgm i mean there has to be an explanation for it what is so special about us as boras that we do something which everybody mm-hmm. else does not do so please explain that to me so great um, that's also an interesting question rohan parthe does the person who is being cut has have any say in it is it done in hospitals is it done by doctors and of course we've discussed you know the issue of of the ban which is part of your fight but the question really parthe is asking is <clears throat> does the person who is being cut have any say in it the answer obviously is a 7 year old does not but since you've been through it masuma yourself i'd like to hear it from you rather than me answering that no definitely not i think 7 is such an age where you have very little understanding you are an innocent child you do not have a say your mother whatever your mother says and your grandmother says you will very willingly and gladly go and get it done Uh, there is no question of consent at the age of seven, even by law. Seven is not an age where you can give consent, and um, so a child does not have a say in the matter. So it, it's it's a question. It's it's something which is done without consent. And isn't that betrayal, Masuma? There's so much deceit and betrayal attached to this young seven-year-old being taken. Absolutely. In fact, the whole. whole practice stinks of betrayal it stinks of deceit because it is done and you talk to any woman who has undergone fgm and she will tell you that she was told that she will be given a candy or she will be given a dream of a garden or she will be given a bicycle or she will be given some material gift for going out but she was never told that okay we are going to be taking you somewhere and you are going to be cut and this is what's going to happen to you never is this information shared 
even today it's not being shared with girl children so the children are literally pinned down to the ground or pinned down to the bed and their arms and legs yes, yes. are just fact, forcibly one, held one of the persons in my in our group she narrated her own instance of her daughter she told her daughter you have an infection so i'm taking you to you know just see that that infection is sorted out so it's cheating it's something which is you know not uh, you're not you're not told the truth you're not told the right thing when you're taken for it can i say something about uh, the movement which we are trying to build on this issue so over the last few years you know from this 2011 when this petition happened uh, i think a lot of women got enthused and a lot of women got the courage to speak out and there have been a lot of efforts there's been a film which has been made by an nid student there is an ngo which has been formed by bora young bora girls who were Sayo. very sayo who were very inspired and were very taken up by this issue and have been working uh, on this issue for some time and then this whole platform which we have created which is called speak out on fgm which is a broad collective and a very democratic platform and it's open to anybody who feels strongly about the issue who wants to speak out about the issue and who wants to join us in the campaign to fight against fgm so we have created these platforms and these spaces we have a facebook page where you know you can come and share we also have an email id because if you do not want to do it publicly because this is such a sensitive issue we have an email id which is speak out on fgm@gmail.com you can write in the anonymity will be maintained because we all understand and we all know the fear persecution which runs deep in our community so if at all you want to communicate with us please you can write to us and the idea is that we join hands we collectively build our solidarity this is not a battle which we can fight alone this is not my battle or it's not your battle it's a battle of women of the community we want men of the community also to join us and of course we want support from the outside communities as well and uh, we need to you know because there is a religion involved there is culture involved there is tradition involved there are human rights involved there is a child rights abuse which is involved so there are lot of complexities which are there and we all need to put into our resources together and work together and the numbers also show that the problem is rather severe because uh, sayo did a survey um, amongst 400 bora respondents and 80% said they have been cut that is a huge huge statistic you know absolutely huge statistic which is why the fight back is so important and of course masuma thank you for being here and more power to you and your battle thank, thank you. you so much